week 15. Man, if you've made it this far, you are so spiritual. You are so good. Well, you may not be spiritual and you may not be a good person and that doesn't matter. If you've trusted Christ, then, you know, that's who we trust, right? Okay, I've been listening to this podcast, then, you know, you know the, the drill, right? This is Jerry Rothhauser. This is Spiritual Rants. We go through the Bible in a year following the readings in the one-year Bible that you can buy. Or, you know what? You can just pull up the readings online. It's free, just like this podcast. So anyway, what I want to talk about this week, to begin with, of course we're going to go through the scriptures for the week, for next week, starting in the end of Deuteronomy 33 and going into Joshua. Uh, Pretty deeply, actually, and pretty quickly, and some great stories in there. And then uh, Luke, uh, like 13, and several chapters there. And then some Psalms and Proverbs, just like we usually do. But what I want to talk about is this popular book and movie, and I saw it a couple of weeks ago, The Shack. It's not about a basketball player. It's about an actual shack. And a pastor friend of mine said, well, go see it. You'll enjoy it. Just remember that it's a metaphor, and it's filled with metaphors. And that's fine if the metaphors are doctrinally correct and precise, but they're not. You've got this shack And it was the place of a crime. And they represent the Trinity as a a kindly middle-aged black lady. He's, well, I mean, she, she's the father. And then kind of a hip Hispanic guy, uh, Jesus. No, you know what? I don't think they did call him Jesus. He's Jesus. And then you have this really pretty Asian gal, and she's the Holy Spirit. Anyway, okay, I'm suspending all of that. It's a metaphor. All right. And there were some good things in there. You know, if you go see the movie, you know, I think you can get some things out of it. Maybe if you read the book and waste your time. I mean, if you want to read the book, uh, you probably could get something out of it. This was kind of, this is a funny aside. At least it's a it's a funny aside to me. I went to a writer's conference several years ago. And one of the agents, and that's one reason you go to a writer's conference, is hoping to, to pick up an agent. And I did. I didn't pick up a publisher through the agent, at least yet, after all these years. But anyway, so this one agent not my agent, was asked the question, would you have represented the shack? And he said, well, uh, not then, but yeah, now. In other words, it made a lot of money. So be careful what you read in Christian publishing, because sometimes... It is based on whether it makes money or not. And obviously, everything I've written, which is an entire commentary for the Bible and a theology book for lay people and a book on spirituality, won't make money. So I'm not being published. All right, anyway, so the shack. So there's the Trinity. And basically, the whole idea is centered on this poor little girl who's murdered. And then the father has to decide if he forgives the murderer or not. That's really the core of the book. And so, you know, I don't think I'm giving anything away about the shack is it's about just forgiving everybody. 
uncon- unconditionally. And kind of the implication, God does too. All right, that's not biblical. doesn't matter what the metaphor is. Yes, we should forgive people. God forgives everyone, but there's a catch. The catch for God is you have to trust Christ who paid the price for all sin. So all of us have sinned. Romans 4, like 12, original sin. You know, we're, we're born in sin, and then we sin. And if you don't believe that, well, you need to think about that a little bit more. I've met a couple of people that didn't think they had ever sinned, and then they thought about it. You kind of can't get around that. Anyway, the reason I'm talking about this anyway is because in Luke... We're going to cover that, and also it it touches upon Joshua when we get to Joshua. So the fella in the movie just ends up forgiving because I guess he's a nice guy. I don't know. Uh, Forgives the murderer. But what does the Bible really say about that? The Bible really says that there's judgment for sinners. You know, there's one way or another to deal with it. One is you trust Christ who paid for your sins for you, or you pay for it yourself in eternity. There's at least two judgments when we'll look at things, uh, when we look at end times. There's a judgment for Christians called the Bema Seat. Don't correct me. I know you want to say Bema Seat. Now, I don't care if you do, actually. But I think it's Bema Seat, looking at the Greek Bema Seat. Anyway, it's a special judgment for Christians, and that's where we get awards or not. Uh, Usually, pastors don't talk about that. In fact, there was a, a pastor of a large church came and visited our tiny little church start years ago. And he said, "What? what's that? What's the fill in the blank on your sermon outline here? I said, Bema seat, judgment. He had no idea. He was pastoring the largest church in town. Had no idea. We're, we'll cover it multiple times. And then there's what I call the GWT, the Great White Throne. You don't want to be there. It's only for... You know, one place one ends up after that. H-E double hockey stick. So, anyway, we get back into forgiveness. There's only one way you can have your sin covered in a positive way is trust in Christ. The other way is a negative. All right, here is what Luke 17, 3 and 4 says, and that's in our reading for this week. That's why I'm focusing on it. Luke 17, 3, be on your guard, Jesus says. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Verse 4, if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, Jesus said, forgive him. Now, I read about this. I read a commentary when I was a young Christian, multiple decades ago. And the expositor who was writing on this emphasized if he repents, then you forgive him. If he repents. Now, uh, I've studied Greek. And so what something I, I learned was that in Greek there's more than way, more than one way to say if. I mean it says if, but it means multiple things. One thing, I and mean, we don't have that in English, but they have it in Greek. It's a little more precise. And it can be if and then Absolutely, it will happen then. 
But there's a hypothetical in Greek that means if and maybe, maybe not. So that is the type of Greek right here in English. And it doesn't translate really unless you break it all out like I'm doing. It's if your brother sins and if he repents. So he might repent and he might not repent. And if he does, then you forgive him. Now, the expositor was putting the emphasis on the repenting, because that's his background, so, you know, he's going to do that. I don't think that the passage puts the emphasis on repenting. I think it puts the emphasis on forgiving. So we should always be prepared to forgive someone. Now, I do think they are supposed to change, have a change of mind. That's what repent means. So there's not like any kind of like they need to come and cry and, oh, we were least, we're sorry. You no, know, they don't have, what they have to do is change their mind and therefore their actions will change. Now that is what they have to do. So in the shack, the guy, the maid character, you watch the movie, read the book. He didn't have to forgive that guy. And you know what? It's not up to him anyway. It's not up to him anyway. The forgiving is to re reestablish a relationship or have a relationship with the person who has offended you. Same as with, with God, with Jesus. If you offend him, that's a sin. If you repent, you change your mind, you change your actions, then uh, you can have a relationship with him again. And, and it doesn't affect whether you go to hell or not. If you've trusted Christ, you will go to heaven. You won't go to hell. On the way, you can break your association with him and break your fellowship with him. And we've covered that, Psalm 66, 18, and 19. If you sin, you have a broken relationship with God, and there's a verse in Isaiah on that too. I'll have to give it to you next week. But it says that there's a breach between us and God when we sin. That's Isaiah. I'll find it for you. Anyway, um, you need to ask for forgiveness and repent, change your mind, and then your resultant actions will be changed also. And so the guy in the movie didn't have to forgive the murderer. Now, whether he forgives them or not, the important thing is, did God forgive that person? Did that person ask for forgiveness from God for his sins? then all of his sins are covered and then he needs to go and probably ask for forgiveness to the main character in that book. And here's what I'm saying. If you're being abused by someone and, and you're not responsible to forgive them seven times a day or seven times seven, another scripture says, now, you can stand ready to forgive that person, but if they're really, no, you know, it's something that's not minor and something that's recurrent, like a husband, wife, you know, if your wife is being abusive, we don't talk about that probably often enough, but obviously a husband is in the situ the place of being abusive and has more clout as the leader of the family to hurt his wife. And he continually does that. Wife doesn't have to forgive him for that. That's a misnomer. That's a mistake. There's a fella who I've been friends with longer with him than I've known my wife decades and at times he becomes very abusive 
partially, I think, because I'm a Christian. I don't know if he is or not, although he's involved in religion deeply. But he becomes really insulting and really abusive. And I've had to cut him off during that 40-something years. And he seems to get the idea, and then we become friends. But recently, I've just had to cut him off completely. Just completely. Because it's that bad. And I'm obligated to protect myself. I don't have to waste time when people want to be friends and then they're really mean and abusive. There's a pastor friend of mine that says you should be uh, friends with people that celebrate you, not that tolerate you. Well, if they're abusive, you you certainly don't have to spend time with them. And I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, oh, but judge not that you be not judged. Right? How many times have Christians had to tolerate the misinterpretation of Matthew 7, 1? Judge not that you be not judged. Well, that's true. That's because God is the judge. And in Romans twelve eighteen, it says, as far as it, it goes with us, we should live peaceably with everyone. That's true. We should. But if we can't, then we can't. And we need to protect ourselves. And by the way, in an aside, a little bit of an aside, people ask, well, but what about countries going to war? Well, um, again, I'd have to give you the scriptures. It's like in Timothy somewhere that it says that countries have the authority to to wield, wield, it's a weird scripture, wield the sword which means sword, missiles, rockets, flamethrowers, to protect the country. They're they're allowed to do that. But when, and I know what you're going to ask, what about turning the cheek? Well, that's in the Sermon on, on the Mount, too. And what that means is when you're representing Christ and you're witnessing to him and you're showing love to people and they're being abusive, well, then you can turn the other cheek in that kind of an environment. And then, again, you're saying, but judge not that you be not judged. Yeah, well, that's, that's in that instance, when you're representing the Lord, then you leave judgment up to him. However, it can't mean what people say it means, when they're being critical of Christians, judge not that you be not judged, because that's in verse 1 of Matthew 7. You drop down a few verses to verse 6 in the Sermon on the Mount there, and it says, don't throw your pearls before swine. Kind of interesting, right? How can you tell who the swine are unless you judge and be critical? So there's a difference between judging and judging. Okay, did you get that? In fact, you can check it out on my blogs. I have a blog called Judging or Judging, because there's two kinds. All right, now, you may say, but God is loving. He is loving. What people leave out of the equation is the other side of the coin. He's all holy. We don't think about that. In these modern times, it's just God is all loving. That's the shack. So, yeah, I'm judging the shack. They're not judging anyone. Well, you know what? They'd probably be judging me. There was a couple starting a church, and they were into some kind of strange theology. You know, they don't, they're always tolerant. Of course, that's the, the sin of the age, is being intolerant. But they were tolerant of everyone. And I said, how about like uh, fundamentalists that, you know, just completely take the Bible literally? Do you judge them? Are you tolerant of them? 
<laughs> it was a husband and wife team, and they they answered different things at exactly the same time. One said yes, one said no. The answer was no. They're not tolerant to people who they think are intolerant. All right. Anyway, we go to Joshua because you're going to be reading Joshua 7 about a guy who's just aching. And the reason he's aching is because he sinned. God said, wipe out the people in Ai. Ai, yay. They were supposed to be wiped out. Okay, I know, I know you're going to ask, how can God wipe out entire groups of people? All right, we're going to get there. Let's just focus on Achan here. They, the Jews who had been immensely successful in battle, and then all of a sudden they lost. And Joshua prayed about it. By the way, Joshua, since we're getting into Joshua, Joshua basically means Savior. Jesus is the Greek form of the Hebrew, which I won't give you the Hebrew exactly, but Joshua is an approximation of that. And it means Savior. And he represented the nation of Israel to God like Moses had. Joshua was Moses' right-hand person. And when Moses went up and got the Ten Commandments, Joshua was with them. And when Moses sent spies out to check out the the promised land, Joshua was one of two spies that came back and had a favorable report. And the other guy we're going to talk about very soon. Caleb. There's a neighborhood kid whose name is Caleb. And he's a young guy. But you know what? Maybe he'll live as long as Caleb. Caleb lived a long time. Not as long as Methuselah, but um, he, he lived a long time and was healthy, too. In fact, Moses, we're going to find out, was pretty healthy when he died. All right. Which, which we would like to be, right? Live to be like 120. We're going to find out Caleb went past like mid-80s, and was very healthy. Okay, I'm way off the track. Joshua means Savior, and that's like the 33rd most popular name for boys these days, Joshua. Now, I know a gal, fantastic gal, and her name is Yeshua. And Yeshua is like a form of Joshua, And she got saved. Isn't that cool? At any rate, we go back to Achan, who was Achan. Why was he Achan? Well, Joshua gave the command to subdue these people and don't touch the booty. That didn't sound right, did it? Don't touch the spoil of the battle. How's that? All right. And Achan just couldn't help himself, so he stole a bunch of stuff that he wasn't supposed to take. And as a result, the entire nation was tainted, and they lost the battle. And Joshua was able to single out from the tribe who had done it and who was responsible. It was Achan. And guess what happened to him? He got stoned. Okay, that didn't sound right either in this day and age, but he got actually stoned with stones and rocks and was killed. And you go, God did that? Loving God commanded that and okayed that? Yes, because you don't get that God is holy. That's that's why. And this was the, the inception of the nation of Israel. And so things had to be right and according to Hoyle. Who was Hoyle anyway? It it had to be according to God, according to Yahweh and the laws and Moses. Achan didn't conform to that, and he got off, he and his family. Now, there is an analogy to Ananias and Sapphira. 
in Acts 5. They lied to the Holy Spirit at the very beginning of the church. And they got offed because of that. They both dropped dead separately in church. Because, you, you know, you're saying, how can that happen? Well, because God is God and he's all holy. So he is. He's all loving, but he's also all holy. So, all right. So, that's the story of Luke 17 and Joshua 7. By the way, and we're going to go through all of the end of Deuteronomy and Joshua quickly, hit the high spots, because I am trying to help you understand what you're reading. And you are supposed to be reading it, you know. <laughs> uh, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Luke. And so I'm going to take you through all of that. But in regards to the shack, don't be shaken. In regards to the shake, the shack. Or if you have a sheik over for lunch or dinner, don't don't believe him either. But don't be tr don't be fooled about what the Bible says about judging and forgiving everyone. So yes, we stand to forgive everyone. We're ready. And if they're willing to repair the breach in our relationship, then you you should understand that and try to be friends again. But if they don't, I don't think you're responsible, but you know, God is the one who separates everyone out anyway. You know, Patton maybe had the right idea, he said, in World War II. Um, you know, we're going to send them to God and he can separate people out from there. I'm paraphrasing, but you get the idea. Okay, now, we're going to whip through all of these passages quickly. Deuteronomy 33, 27 is in your reading. And maybe you love this psalm, and maybe you don't even know it, but you should. Leaning on the everlasting arms. You know that hymn? Where did you think that was come from? Where where did you think that had come from? Well, if you're like me, you thought it probably came from Psalms. It sounds like that, but it didn't. It came from Deuteronomy 33, 27. The eternal God is a dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Isn't that great? Just, you know, you fall and God's right there to catch you. It's just great. And that's who we should lean on. Deuteronomy 34, 7 gets to the end of Deuteronomy. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his vigor abated. JFK would have liked that. He had uh, full vigor. And his eye did not dim. He didn't have, you know, lasering done. I, I have, but he, he didn't. He could see great. Wouldn't that be wonderful at 120 years old? I've told you, we had a lady in our church out in the country who was 104. And when 102, I visited her in the hospital, visited her in the hospital, and I said, anything I can do for you or you know, what What can I do? She said, I, I need a million dollars. Now, why she needed a million dollars? At her age, I have no idea at 102. I don't know. I think she was kidding. Joshua chapter 1. This is great. You, you find this even back in Deuteronomy. As you were reading in Deuteronomy, Moses was telling Joshua... To be strong and courageous, wouldn't you thought he would have been strong and courageous? But he was needing that encouragement in Joshua 1, six. For you shall give this people possession of the land, which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only, in verse 7, only be strong and very courageous. There's a Michael W. Smith song early on. Look in his first, like, second record. It's really a cool song. Now, 
chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, you should memorize. I memorized that, I think, like the first week I was saved. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. That doesn't mean that you talk like this. That doesn't mean that you're mumble. No. It means it shall not from, not from depart. I mean, that means you're supposed to be talking about it all the time. All right? All right. And you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Someone, when I was at Butler, and my wife said, people maybe don't know that you're really saying Butler. When I was at college, and there I was saved, someone said, well, Jerry, you're prospering because you get good grades. I think it was lucky. <laughs> anyway, they thought because I was I was being uh, committed to the Lord that I was prospering at college. Anyway, verse 9, I'm not making any money now, so, you know, it can't mean that. I think it means spiritually. Verse 9, have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? There it is again. Why did he need to be reminded all the time? Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Memorize those. All right, verse 18, same chapter. Again, be strong and courageous. Is he not getting the idea? Well, I think he is. Chapter 2 is about Rahab, the harlot. And, you know, I'm not going to go through everything in detail, you need to read about that. She was in the Hall of Faith, not the Hall of Fame, but in Hebrews 11, she's mentioned as a prostitute. Shows God's grace, doesn't it? And so God rescued her, even though the Israelites were raiding in to her hometown. Then, you know how they crossed the Red Sea to get into the wilderness, they crossed, crossed the Jordan to get out. That's in Joshua 3. And it says the Jordan River will be cut off and the waters which are flowing down from above will stand, stand in one heap. It was like it was wheat, but it was water. So they walked through and it was dry. They commemorated it in chapter 4 with 12 stones. It wasn't gallstones, it was stones to, to have a, a memorial. <laughs> uh, the last trip I took to the East Coast, like a decade or more ago, I wanted to visit where Washington crows, crossed the uh, Delaware, and there's a memorial there. It's not even stones. It was like a a wooden plaque that is there. You, you could miss it if you didn't know it was there. Sad, but great, unbelievably important incident in the history of our country. All right, so that's uh, in chapter 4, Joshua. Chapter 5. Joshua meets the captain of the host of the Lord. Guess who that was? How many times have I mentioned to you that Jesus is all throughout the Bible, including the Old Testament? So the captain of the host of the Lord, a.k.a. the angel of the Lord, is Jesus. He was commanded to march around the city in Joshua 6. You know what city we're talking about, right? Jericho. And they were commanded to, to blow trumpets. There's a well-known pastor. <laughs> I was going to the church there. Wanted a parchment of land close to the church. And he took people out from the church and marched around that parcel of land. In imitation of Joshua. Uh, he did get the land, but I don't think it works that way. Anyway, 
That's what he did. Joshua 7 was about what we've talked about, Ai, the men of Ai. They had defeated Israel, which was not something the, the Jews had been used to. And so the people, the hearts of the people melted and became as water as a result. We told you what happened there. Joshua called out Achan, and you found out why he was Achan, because that hurts, being stoned. Chapter 8, the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear or be dismayed. Is this guy dense? No, he's human, like us. That's why we need to read the Bible every day, right? Then there's the story of the Gibeonites. They were afraid of the Israelites, and so they posed uh, and acted as if they were out of town and had come a long way and wore beat-up clothes and said, you know, we're not like these people that you're trying to wipe out on God's behalf. Which, by the way, I, I said I would give you the answer on that. Why would God wipe out these people? Well, it was a land that they wanted for his own people, but but big part of that was they were these were bad dudes, extremely bad dudes. How bad were they? Think of the worst sins you could think of. Incest, um, child sacrifice, murder, adultery is nothing compared to what these people were involved with. And they needed to be wiped out. And by the way, probably going to mention that again later, but I'll mention it now. The quote from C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis said during the time of war, and he was writing like during World War II, he said during time of war, the death rate does not increase. It doesn't go up during war. That's puzzling, isn't it? Well, he said that's because it's still one-to-one. -one. Everyone dies once. That's Hebrews 9, 27. And after that, they get judged. That's what that scripture says. But... He was right. So, you know, if God decides they're going to end up being judged and he doesn't want them in the land, then it makes total sense for the Jews to wipe them out. Now, think about that. And also remember, he's a holy God. So the Jews took on people from that area and... They protected the Gibeonites because they had lied to the Jews, but the Jews swore an oath to protect them. And then other people in the area, although I do have to mention the Gibeonites were uh, to become slaves, hewers of wood, and drawers of water for the house of my God. That's not like drawers like you put clothes in. That's drawers of water for the house of my God. So despite their lying, Joshua protected them when other kings were doing God's work for him and was wiping out a bunch of the pagans in that area. And hailstones wiped out more of these people than had been destroyed by swords and fistfights, I guess, whatever, and stones that they'd used back then. Now, they didn't have enough time in the day. In Indiana, our uh, governor, Mitch, said that we need to change the time. I don't know why he did that, but he did, and, and it happened. Because he said, you know, farmers need more time. Well... The Jews needed more time to wipe these people out. And so Joshua asked God to have the sun stand still. You ever heard of that? That's in Joshua 10, verses 12 through 14. 
And so God prolonged the day. And, you know, even now, when scientists try to do uh, mathematical equations on time, what they find out is doesn't come out right. And then when they put in this extra time from Joshua, then it makes sense. So it's like scientifically proven that it's not that the sun actually stands still. That's a, a metaphor, figure of speech. But you know what happened, all right? So, you know, maybe the earth stand stood still. But the point is, verse 14, no day has been like it or since. And isn't that the truth? All right. So, God prolonged the day to wipe out more people. Joshua 13.1, Joshua was old and advanced in years when the Lord said to him, you're old and advanced in years. Because he was, he was old and advanced in years. And very much of the land remains to be possessed. So, uh, Joshua continued on with his job. And then, I told you about Caleb in Joshua 14, 7, he says, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought word back to him as it was in my heart. Then in verse 10, now behold, the Lord has let me live just as he spoke these 45 years, that makes them 85, from the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses when Israel walked in the wilderness, and now behold, I am 85 years old. That's math. I was still as strong today as I was in the day Moses sent me, as my strength was then, so my strength is now for war and for going out and coming in. And he goes on and talks about that. But wouldn't you like to be 85 and still be strong? I see people kind of hunched over, they can't see, etc. Um, boy, is it possible? Yeah, people that live like God wants them to live can still be vigorous as JFK would have liked to have said. And eat like Daniel. Like in the beginning of Daniel, we'll, we'll cover that, but he ate vegetables. And we're going to find out when we get to the prodigal son. Yes, I know, it's the prodigal son. That's not as cute or funny. Um, they brought out the fatted calf for him because they didn't normally eat meat i don't believe they ate wheat and produce and things like that and so they were healthier okay so there's a cute story about joshua 15 uh, and caleb there about how he gave his daughter in marriage but you can read that too let's get to luke quick Current events. Did Jesus read Highlights magazine? I don't know. Like we did in, in school? People asked him about the Galileans whose, book, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all others Galileans because they suffered this fate? Jesus said, I tell you no, but unless you repent, which is the change of mind, metanoia is the Greek, change metanoia, mind. A change of mind, you will all likewise perish. Or verse 4, do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, change mind, result in actions, you will all likewise perish. See, he was evangelizing. So when we see what we see now in the end times, wars, uh, even things re um, regarding towers, airports, tsunamis, all people have one life, 
a probationary period wherein to trust Christ or not. C.S. Lewis was right. One to one. The death rate has not gone up. I think about that every time there's something on the news about a group of people. I mean, there's been two or three in the past week around the world. All of those people who died, they all had one life. And God knew whether they had enough time to trust him or not. That goes for the Gibeonites and all the ites that the Jews subdued or conquered. The Gibeonites had an extra chance and weren't wiped out. And then when you read about Jonah, uh, those people were just as bad as the area in the promised land that got wiped out. They got an extra chance too. Luke fourteen fifteen. He said to them, Which of you will have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day? In other words, don't be a legalist or an idiot in that case. If your ox falls into the well, you know, you got to pull him out, right? It's kind of funny. Uh, I think it was down in Atlanta. And uh, I was uh, uh, in in the uh, midst of some workers, and they were talking about working on Sunday. Of course, Sabbath is not Sunday. We've talked about that. Anyway, he said, "Yeah, my ox fell in a fell in a well," <laughs> and he had to pull them out. It was a metaphor. And I used to work on radio, Christian radio, on Sundays. Well, who was going to run those church programs? Well, I was at the time. That's the only job I could get at the time. I was pulling my ox out of the well at that time. Luke fourteen twenty seven. Whoever does not carry his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So you can't goof around. I mean, you can. You'll suffer at the Bama seat. Well, you won't suffer, but you'll lose rewards there. All right. I said we'd talk about that some other time. Verse 28. For which of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he was has enough to complete it? This is kind of humorous, maybe. There was a televangelist that operated out of Ohio. And he built a big broadcasting tower. And guess what? He didn't have enough money to complete it. So he didn't have the broadcasting tower. All right. Uh, funny to me, perhaps. <laughs> Luke fifteen seven. When a sinner repents and trusts Christ, there's more joy in heaven over that sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. That scripture there indicates that there's angels jumping up and down, by the way. And Phil Kagey wrote uh, a, a song about that. It was a great song, if you can find it. That uh, It's on the um, How the West Was Won, like W-O-N. And you can find it on there. Luke fifteen twenty seven. he said to them, Your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf. Fattened calf. Because he has received him back safe and sound. That's a special occasion. That's why it's mentioned. A fattened calf. They don't usually eat uh, beef. And they did it uh, in Old Testament times during the feasts and the feast celebrations, but not normally. Um, Legalists, the elder son, you could actually call this the parable of the older son because it's a lot about the older sons as much as the prodigal son. They represented the Pharisees and the legalists and the lawyers the Sadducees of the time. They weren't happy that someone actually trusted God or trusted Christ. 
<laughs> they were unhappy about it, which is different than the earlier parts of the, the chapter. Cool things. Read those, by the way. But one was the angels rejoicing. Now, this is interesting. The dishonest steward. This is a mind boggler, unless you understand it. Uh, there's a manager, and he found out he was going to get fired. So what he did was made deals with all the clients <laughs> and discounted all of their bills. It was it was cheating his boss, but after he was fired, he had a lot of friends after that, obviously. And so Jesus used that as an example. You'd say, what? The guy was a crook. Yeah, but here's what Jesus said. I say to you, make friends for yourselves by means of the wealth of unrighteousness so that when it fails, they will receive you into eternal dwellings. So the deal is, here's the deal, is use what you have on earth to evangelize and bring people to, to the Lord and to glorify Christ. That's what the deal is. So you use the, the dirt of the world, like the scummy wealth, and trade it in for spiritual things. Luke 16.10, Jesus said, He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust the true riches to you? And if you have not been faithful in the use of that which is another's who will give you that which is your own. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust the true riches to you? In other words, give to Christian ministries. I went to a Gideon get-together. It was a fundraiser. And the the Gideon in front of everyone, and he was encouraging everyone to give to the Gideons, of course, which isn't so bad. They do a lot of evangelization, and you see their Bibles all the place, all the time in uh, hotels and motels, right? Anyway, the Gideon said, uh, you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. And that's true. That's true. There was a rich man in Luke 16, we're in that chapter still, Lazarus, not the department store, which has gone out of business, I think, owned by Macy's. He was in Hades, and there was a rich man who knew this poor guy who just would sit around because he was so sick. And the rich man was in Hades, in hell, and the poor man was having the time of his afterlife. <laughs> and the rich man said, can't you just, you know, said to God, can't you just get um, that poor man to sprinkle some water on my tongue since I'm so parched? And Jesus said... The moral of the of the story is, if you do not listen to Moses and the prophets, in other words, the Old Testament, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. In other words, if you don't read the word printed on the parchment or written out on the parchment and you don't believe that, you're not going to see a miracle like someone raising from the dead and you're not going to believe that. And what do you know? People don't believe it now. They don't believe it now. Christ raised from the dead. And when I witness to people, I try to always center things on that. Do you believe Christ died and raised from the dead? That's what I talk about. In fact, there's a movie that's opening tomorrow. I'm going to go see it called The Case of Christ. And I'm hoping to see that. 
And it's based on a great book. And that's what it's centered on. Did Christ rise from the dead? There's a Billy Graham movie a long time ago. And one of the main ideas was this idea of uh, a poem called The Hound of Heaven. That God seeks people out to be saved. So don't feel sorry for, you know, the Hivites and whatever they are around there that got wiped out. God made sure that they heard about God. In fact, Rahab was saved. And all she had heard was about the Jews. And she made it into heaven. There was an interview program recently. Dan Rather was the interviewer. Anyway, um, he was interviewing Don Rickles, the king of insults. What was interesting to me was toward the end, they kept talking about, they wouldn't get off of the subject. I don't know why or why they didn't edit it out. I guess they didn't have enough to fill up their time. They had to leave it in. Don Rickles kept saying, because he was like late 80s at the time, that he would wake up each morning and be surprised. He wouldn't know as he fell asleep at night if he'd be waking up in the morning. And as I was putting the finish, the, the, the final touches on my notes for this podcast today, I got a headline beeped in on my phone. Don Rickles had died. Well, he had been thinking about the right things. I don't know if, if he uh, had sought out more truth than that or trusted Christ. I hope he did. Yeah, he's dead today. All those things that he did, entertaining people, making money, hanging out with Frank Sinatra, what was it worth if he hadn't trusted Christ? All right, Luke 17. Uh, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. Now, having been questioned by the Pharisees and to when the kingdom of God was coming... Jesus answered them, and he said, it's not going to do you much much good to be looking for signs. Now, here's what he says. Just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. In other words, they're not going to be looking out for what they should be looking out for. This is a lifetime of probation to get an answer to a pass-fail quiz. What do you do with Christ? Did he raise from the dead? Can you trust him for salvation? Verse 27, they were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they will be given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same as happened in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. So there you go. Like now. Then Jesus said, on that night there will be two one in two in one bed, one will be taken, the other will be left. There will be two women grinding at the same place, one will be taken, the other will be left. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other will be left. And answering they said to him, Where, Lord? And he said to them, Where the body is, there are also The vultures will be gathered. So a lot of people think that's a a description of the rapture. You know, there's two people. One will leave. One will stay. Probably that's a description of Armageddon. They don't get carried away where the vultures will be gathered and where the dead bodies are. Revelation 19, 17 through 19. Armageddon. All right, we got to wrap it up. 
Asaph was writing Psalm 73 to, 73 to 83, his main deal was he didn't understand the, the problem of evil. Why do bad things happen to good people? Then he figured it out. There's a judgment day. So when you know that about Asaph, you get it about Asaph. So you've already read the beginning of Psalm 78. That's a historical psalm. And then a bunch of laments, the whiny poems. <laughs> and they're actually whiny psalms of the community in 79, 80, and 82, and 83. So, um, will you be angry forever? If you feel that way, O oh Lord, how long you, you feel that way, read Psalm 79. 80, I took a couple of these scriptures, printed them out, and put them on the crib for my son when he was born. Even the shoot with which your right hand is planted and on the son whom you have strengthened for yourself, let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, upon the Son of Man, whom you made strong for yourself. That was about Jesus, but I put it on my son's crib because I wanted him to be blessed. Psalm 81, you might want to memorize this. I, the Lord, am your God, who brought you out from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. You want to be blessed? Meditate on that scripture. There is a problem in Psalm 82. You are gods, and all of you are sons of Most High. Not hard to figure out if you understand that gods was the nickname of the judges of the Jews and the leaders and rulers. They were called gods because they were representatives of God. So you find that in Psalm 58, 1 here in 82, 6. And then Jesus applied it to himself in John 10, 34, because he said, you know, why don't you get it? You, you call your judges and leaders gods, and yet I am the God, the Son of God. Why don't you get it? How can you not get it? That's what he was saying. Psalm 83, again, it was a, a lament. O oh God, do not remain quiet, do not be silent, and do not be still. Psalm 84 is by the sons of Korah. So we already covered the rebellion of Korah. And here, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For... The Lord God is a sun and shield. You may want to memorize this one. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. A promise that you can hold on to. So Korah was a rebel, but his sons turned out okay and writing some psalms. Okay, quickly, some is it cerebral or cerebral cartooning? The answer is it could be either. I like cerebral. And people correct me on things. That, you know, they shouldn't do that because I'm usually right. Uh, well, I was right on this one anyway. It, it could be either way. A, laser, a lazy man does not roast his prey, but the precious possession of a man is diligence. So that's like a cartoon. You know, it's like a lazy guy eats, eats things raw because he's so lazy. But someone who works is going to be blessed. And verse 4 of Proverbs 13, you'll read, The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, but the soul of the diligent is made fat. So similar. Next week, week 16. Can you believe that? Can you believe I thought I was going to have like a 15-minute podcast today? And now we're running almost an hour and five minutes? Yes, you do believe that. Jerry Rothhauser here, spiritualrants.com. Check it out. Send me an email. Tell your friends. Talk to you next week. <laughs>